We have come to one of the lengthier chapters of the framework, the elements of financial statements. There are basically five elements of the financial statements, three of which pertain to financial position, such as assets, liabilities, and equity, while the remaining two refer to financial performance, such as income and expenses. In this chapter, we shall endeavor to define each of these elements according to the conceptual framework. Let's start with assets. An asset is a present economic resource controlled by the entity as a result of past events. An economic resource is a right that has the potential to produce economic benefits. In order for us to fully understand how the framework views an asset, let us first understand right, potential to produce economic benefits, and control. A right that has a potential to produce economic benefits may take many forms such as rights that correspond to an obligation of another party, for example, the right to receive cash and the right to receive goods or services, and rights that do not correspond to an obligation of another party, for example, the right to use intellectual property and right over physical objects such as property, plan, and equipment. One must remember that not all of the entity's rights are assets. To be an asset, the right needs to have the potential to produce economic benefits for and in the control of the entity. For example, all entities have the right to use the public highway, but such right does not provide any exclusive benefit to the entity itself and is not controlled by the said entity, so this is not considered an asset. An entity also cannot have a right to obtain economic benefits from itself. This is the reason why an entity's treasury shares cannot be considered an asset. What produces rights? How do entities obtain rights? Well, the framework is quick to note that many rights are established by contracts, such as the right to collect cash from sales. Legislation, such as the right to operate a broadcasting station is granted by a franchise, and similar means. Let us now talk about potential to produce economic benefits. A very important term that must be dealt with in this phrase is the word potential. This means that for the potential to exist, it does not have to be certain nor even likely. According to the framework, it is only necessary that the right already exists and that, in at least one circumstance, it would produce for the entity economic benefits beyond those available to other parties. These economic benefits can come in many forms, such as, for example, the right to receive cash from collections of receivable, the right to receive cash from sale of inventories, the right to receive rental payments from leasing its property, and others. To complete the triad of understanding an asset, let us talk about control. According to the framework, control is the present ability to direct the use of the economic resource and obtain the economic benefits that may flow from it. For example, if you own an item of property, plant, and equipment, then you have control over how the asset is to be used as well as control over the economic benefits that you can get from the said property, plant, and equipment. The second element is liability. A liability is a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of past events. From this definition, three key concepts emerge. Number one. A liability must be a present obligation. An obligation is a duty or responsibility that an entity has no practical ability to avoid and is always owed to another party or parties. Simply put, this is the opposite of a right. Where one has the obligation to transfer economic resources, another party has the right to receive the said economic resources. But then perhaps you have also wondered, what establishes obligations? Similar to rights, obligations are established by contract, such as the obligation to make payments owing to purchases, legislation, such as the obligation to pay taxes, and other similar means. The framework also recognizes the concept of constructive obligation, which is normally sourced from the company's customary practices, published policies, or specific statements if the entity has no practical ability to act in a manner inconsistent to it. For example, an entity has made a public statement and has communicated to the local government unit that it will give 1,000 sets of swab kits to a local hospital for free as part of its assistance in the fight against COVID-19. 
even when there is no contractual obligation, the entity now has a constructive obligation to deliver said kits. The second criterion is the obligation to transfer economic resource. Similar to an asset, the potential to transfer economic resource need not be certain nor likely. In the case, for example, of provisions for warranties, it is not certain that there will be an actual warranty claim in the future, but it still has to be recognized as a liability because the moment that the inventory has been sold, the warranty is already attached to it. The third criterion is that present obligation must be a result of past events. According to the framework, a present obligation exists as a result of past events only if the entity has already obtained economic benefits or taken an action. For example, the entity already obtained the proceeds of a loan or the entity has already consumed the, the utilities, which are unpaid. And, as a consequence, the entity will or may have to transfer an economic resource that it would not otherwise have had to transfer. This is the case when, for example, principal and interest repayments need to be made or payments must be made for utility companies. The third element is equity. Equity is the residual interest in the assets of the entity after deducting its liabilities. In other words, it is what is left of its assets after satisfying its obligations. So these three make up the elements pertaining to financial position, assets, liabilities, equity. Best remembered with the basic accounting equation, assets equal liabilities, plus owner's equity. Let's now talk about the elements for financial performance, income and expenses. These two have relatively straightforward definitions, with the framework defining income as increases in assets or decreases in liabilities that result in increases in equity, other than those relating to contributions from holders of equity claims. On the other hand, expenses are defined as decreases in assets or increases in liabilities that result in decreases in equity other than those relating to distributions to holders or equity claims. Simply put, anything that increases assets or decreases liabilities not related to contributions from equity holders is income. And anything that decreases assets or increases liabilities other than payments or distributions to equity holders is an expense. Take for example the rendering of service for cash. There is an increase in an asset, that is cash, but the said increase did not come from the contribution of a shareholder. Rather, it comes from a sale. Ergo, this is income. Or take for example the consumption of electricity. It recognizes a decrease in an asset because you have to pay for the electricity, but the payment is not owing to distributions to owners. In other words, contributions or investments by equity holders are not income. The same way that distributions to equity holders such as dividends or profit sharing are not expenses. So there we have it, the elements of the financial statements, assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expenses. Before we bid goodbye to this chapter, let us first talk about two additional concepts that are mentioned by this framework for this section, the concepts of unit of account and executory contracts. To be quite honest, this chapter talks about the unit of account in length, but the concept may appear quite confusing to some. Simply put, let's just imagine a unit of account as the grouping of assets and liabilities for financial reporting purposes, to which the recognition criteria and measurement concepts are applied. So for example, a purchase of ball pens for office use will be recognized as one unit of account office supplies. A purchase of a ream of bond paper is also recognized under the same unit of account office supplies, but a purchase of merchandise for sale is to be recognized as inventory it's another unit of account. Unpaid purchases will be recognized as accounts payable, but unpaid electricity bill is an accrued liability. Unpaid water bill is also an accrued liability. Perhaps the simplest way to imagine a unit of account is a portfolio, or in the most elementary of terms, your account titles and line items. The other concept discussed briefly in this chapter is that of executory contracts. According to the framework, an executory contract is a contract or a portion of a contract that is equally unperformed 
neither party has fulfilled any of its obligations or both parties have partially fulfilled their obligations to an equal extent. Because an executory contract represents a combined right and obligation, the combined right and obligation constitute a single asset or liability. In this case, the entire executory contract is deemed as one unit of account. Ergo, if in the assessment of the entity, the terms of the exchange are currently favorable, the entire executory contract is recognized as an asset. Otherwise, it's recognized as a liability. A common example of an executory contract is that of leases. If you would notice, the rights and obligations are interdependent and cannot be separated. Just think of it this way. A lessor's right to collect rent from the lessee is interdependent on the lessor providing rental space to the lessee. If he can't provide the rental space, that is an obligation, then he can't collect rent, and that is the right. In the same manner, the right of the lessee to continue occupying the rental space is interdependent on the lessee's obligation to pay rent. So there you have it, Chapter 4. While this chapter is quite rich in concepts, here are our major takeaways. The elements of the financial statements are assets, liabilities, equity, these pertain to financial position, and then income and expenses which pertain to financial performance. An asset is a present economic resource controlled by the entity as a result of past events. An economic resource, on the other hand, is a right that has the potential to produce economic benefits. We have to remember that not all rights are assets. For it to be an asset, the entity needs to have control over the potential economic benefits. And we have to remember as well that the potential to produce economic benefits does not need to be certain, nor likely. A liability is a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of past events. Both rights and obligations can be established by contract, legislation, and other means. But in the case of liability, there can be such a thing as a constructive liability. Equity equals assets minus liabilities. Equity is residual. Income and expenses are movements in assets or liabilities that affect equity other than contributions by or distributions to owners. A unit of account determines the level at which an asset or liability is grouped or ungrouped for financial reporting. And an executory contract is a contract or a portion thereof that is equally unperformed. Executory contracts are usually one unit of account. In other words, the rights and obligations are accounted as one unit. And that's chapter 4. We are already halfway through the framework. I'll see you in chapter 5.